Hi, Shalom friends. Tsar Nikolai I was not known to be a great admirer or friends of the Jews, and uh, he had a perverse sense of humor in addition to his cruelty. There, it is most probably a fable, but it is reported that one day, in one of his uh, terrible moods, he calls in a wealthy Jewish industrialist, and as soon as he comes in, the Tsar shouts at him, You Jews! Mother Russia gives you everything and all you do is take. Look at Rabinowitz. He owns the largest factory of sugar production. He makes thousands and thousands of rubles a year. What does he do for Russia? The Jewish industrialist says, Indeed, uh, Your Majesty, it is the kindness of you and of Mother Russia, but he does give some 30,000 rubles a year as a very high tax for the privilege of making money. And Tsar Nikolai just waves his hand, humbug, it's all, it's all mine anyway. And what do you say about um, Radonsky? You know how, how wealthy he is? He owns all of the, the vodka production in this and this province. What does he do for Russia? And once again, the wealthy industrialist says, but your majesty, he raises X amount of money for his majesty's army through the high taxes. Ah! It's all mine anyway. And the industrialist is quiet. And Tsar Nikolai looks at him and says, You know what? Your brethren, they breathe the pure air of Russia. I'd like something back from them. I'd like 10,000 rubles in 30 days. And I don't want it from factories because what I'm getting from them belongs to me anyway. And the wealthy Jew doesn't bat an eyelid, and he says, Your Majesty, if I'm not to get it from the shopkeepers or the factory owners, from where am I supposed to get the, these rubles? And he says, I don't care. Get it from the ear. Just bring it in 30 days. And the industrialist says, can I have it in writing? And he laughs, sure. And he dictates that this and this Jew is required to bring 10,000 rubles at the end of 30 days to be produced from air itself. And the man bows, thanks him for the privilege, and he leaves. Of course, how in the world can you make money without using any of the resources of of, of manufacturing. Well, he was going back and forth until he had a brilliant idea. He gets himself a meeting with one of the great factories in Moscow. When he sees the owner, he says, um, I am going to close your factory for 30 days. He says, by what right? He says, by the Tsar's imperial decree. He said, let me see that takes out a paper. It says that so-and-so is required to produce 10,000 rubles from here. He says, what does that mean? He says, it's very simple. Um, His Majesty has given me the rights to produce rubles from the air, but I cannot do it because you're polluting the air with the smoke of your factory. He says, you got to be kidding. This is ridiculous. He says, do you want to take this up with the Tsar himself? Read what it says. I am to produce 10,000 rubles out of ear, and I can do that, but not with you smoking. And he sees that the Jew is very, very serious. He says, look, look, we both know that this is uh, incorrect. It's ridiculous, as a matter of fact. Um, I, I can't close my factory. He says, well, you have to. He says, can we work this out? He said, yeah, if you give me 500 rubles, uh, I will allow you to keep your factory open. And sure enough, he did that same trick with another factory and another factory. And in much less than 30 days, he had raised an exorbitant amount of money, which was being created from air itself. The end of the story is not important. And many people, when they tell over this fable, they, they, they're very proud. You see how clever the Jew is. He was able to create money from air. 
But I think that perhaps in this fable, this lies actually a much of a deeper lesson, and that is, it is possible to create real value even if you don't have physical resources. Let me digress just for a moment. Man is uh, amazing in the 21st century what it's been able to accomplish and what it hopes to accomplish. And certainly, if we were to look at a, a scientist or a group of scientists in one of these hundred million dollar laboratories and compare them to a cow, we would say there's no comparison. We're talking about wisdom, we're talking about excellence, we're talking about um, brilliance. What does a cow do? But pray tell, has any scientist come up with a machine that you put in hay and out comes milk? No, I mean that seriously. If we were just to think for a moment about the wonders of nature, we would be enthralled. The lowly grass or flower with photosynthesis, we haven't had and are still looking for a source of energy to access direct energy from the sun. We're making progress, sure, with billions of dollars of research and every grass, anything that grows, produces it, oxygen, and so on, from the sun itself. And look at the, the redwood. Has anyone ever thought of how is it possible to transport nutrients from deep within the ground to hundreds of feet high without a pump? Yes, my friends, man is brilliant, but we have a lot to be humbled by looking at the world of nature. So if the brilliance of man, as ex exciting as it might be, ultimately is just a degree higher than nature, where does man truly excel in? And that is his capability of creating something out of nothing. When I say something, I mean a real energy. I mean a real force, a power. And I'm referring primarily to the Jewish people, though by extension, all people can do something of this. There is no factory that produces holiness. There is no school that produces spirituality. Every one of us can create something out of nothing. There is no um, raw material called holiness. And yet, every Jew, when he takes some flour and water and bakes it into a challah and then puts it on his Friday night Shabbos dinner and then washes his hands and says a blessing, and sits with his family and extols God for the Shabbos and for the privilege of eating food that grew from earth. We're not talking a meal. We're talking an act of devotion. The feeling that's created and the energy that's created is called the holiness of Shabbos. And how, we, how are we producing this holiness of Shabbos? From the material of water, and flour, and the heat and the energy of, of the oven. When a Jewish person walks into his house and puts his hand on a mezuzah, which essentially is a piece of animal skin, what is he doing? He's connecting to the infinite. He's drawing upon himself a sense of awareness of something very holy and sublime. But how can he do that? It's just a piece of parchment. That is the power of a Jew. Not to make rubles out of air, but to make holiness out of animals. Soon we'll be celebrating Hanukkah. We all have seen different Hanukkah menorahs. The children make it out of wood, out of, they paint pottery. We've seen some beautiful gold and silver. But when you're looking at the flames, you're not looking at pottery, wood, or gold. You're in the presence of something very powerful. 
a direct connection to thousands of years ago, to a time of miraculous and spirituality being revealed. We are amazing people. We can create out of the physical a brand new product or a brand new make creating a result which is way beyond from the physical to something which is non-physical which loosely I will call the spiritual. The mystics point out <clears throat> that what man does is to complete the process that God started. <clears throat> Excuse me. God created the world. There were no materials that he used. So out of nothing, he created something. And we complete the cosmic circle. When we take the something that we deal with on a daily basis, and we make that into a nothingness, into a non-material, into a non-physical, into something from finite into the infinite, we actually are creating what God created, a sense of something out of nothing. Well, you might be satisfied with making a puzzle in your life. You might be challenged to build a building to create a program, but there's nothing, absolutely nothing more rewarding or more human than to be divine itself. Shalom. Shalom.